very good afternoon to all our viewers and welcome to a new edition of Panorama News, our bulletin that brings you the latest in the world of politics, economics and sports. My name is Angie Meher and I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Yasmin Bakir. Very good afternoon to you, Yasmin. Very good afternoon to you. Thank you very much, Angie. And uh, good afternoon to all the viewers who have just tuned in. We're going to start off with the political headlines that are coming up next. President Abdel Fattah Sisi meets with visiting Jordanian King Abdullah II for summit talks. UN backed Syria, talks restart. Barcelona's Argentine superstar Lionel Messi visits Egypt to promote a campaign to fight hepatitis C. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. President Abdel Fattah Sisi met on Tuesday with the visiting Jordanian King Abdullah II at the Ittihadaya Palace. Ahead of the talks, President Sisi received the Jordanian King and an official reception ceremony was held at the Presidential Palace. The summit talks are expected to cover means of boosting bilateral relations. Talks are expected to cover the latest developments in the region, efforts to put the Middle East peace process back on track as well as the situation in Syria. The two leaders are also expected to discuss efforts to fight terrorism. And to shed uh, more light on uh, the visit, we are joined over the telephone by His Excellency Ambassador Ibrahim Ishwami, the former Assistant to the Foreign Minister. A very good afternoon to you, sir. Good afternoon. First and foremost, sir, how do you weigh the timing of the visit by the Jordanian monarch? Yeah, uh, the, this visit is very important. Usually, uh, His Majesty comes to Cairo uh, to discuss matters with uh, pre our President. To, to discuss the matter interested between the two uh, countries and nowadays uh, this is a big problem of uh, this religion. I think it will be on the uh, uh, agenda of uh, discussion between the two... Uh, two, two, Mr. two uh, what? Sorry. Yes, Mr. Ambassador. Um, what are some of the issues, as you were mentioning, the agenda? What issues do you expect to feature on top of the yeah. agenda of the talks? I think the most important thing is the matter of terrorism and also the Palestinian issue and the recent uh, uh, deliberation about uh, the, uh, that problem and the matter of uh, the, some Americans, especially when the President of the United States speaks about Jerusalem uh, and, uh, and also uh, the, the, the solution of the two states. I think this is the most important issues we are going to discuss. Ambassador, also, um, how do you describe the ties between Egypt and uh, Jordan um, on various aspects, whether political, um, business, uh, economy, cultural even? Of course, uh, the, this economy and uh, economic relations between the states and uh, uh, two states, uh, how they uh, can come and uh, they can uh, enrich the exchange of, uh, uh, of commodity, the investment in the two countries. Yes. Right. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, uh, the former assistant to the foreign minister, Ambassador Ibrahim Shumi, thank you very much, sir, uh, for joining us uh, on this edition of Panorama News. A conference gathering the heads of high and constitutional courts in Africa concluded in Cairo on Tuesday. The two days conference was organized by Egypt's higher constitutional court in cooperation with the foreign ministry's agency for cooperation for development. Addressing the inaugural session, Prime Minister Sharif Ismail welcomed the attendees. He said that the Constitutional Court proves that the law is prevailing in the country. 
Speaker of Parliament Dr. Ali Abdelal said that the role of the constitutional court is vital in democratic regimes. He said that constitutional courts are the guarantors that the judicial system is being applied. The conference brought together 25 heads of constitutional courts in Africa. The head of the higher constitutional court, Councillor Abdel Wahab Abdel Razik, and the participants discussed exchanging expertise in the field of constitutional judiciary as well as organizing training sessions. <coughs> On the sidelines of the conference, Nal TV's uh, correspondent Nada Brahim held this exclusive interview with the head of the Nigerian Constitutional Court, Justice Bello Ishaq. Very, very important because uh, when you meet uh, to share experiences, to get best international practices, that will in turn improve your own system. It makes the forum an excellent idea, just as it is now. We are over 26 countries here, African countries, each one with its own experiences on, on the manner and ways of addressing certain challenges in the judiciary. <clears throat> and by this exercise, each one of us, I believe, will go back better than he came, better informed and then with new ideas on how to address common challenges that affect uh, various judiciaries. We have been talking about um, case management, we've been talking about the issues of conflicts that bedevil the African countries and globally, and the various regime in terms of legislation that uh, are put in place to address these uh, uh, crimes, new emerging crimes, also how best to address corruption cases. This we have discussed and we are still discussing, and many others. Well, there should be increased communication, yeah, 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 so we increase communication amongst the various judiciaries on how they have been handling such terrorism cases, how fast are the judiciaries able to decide to finality some of these cases are very crucial in this, in this very forum, this very conference, and I think we are gaining a lot. Also on the sidelines of the conference, Nal TV's correspondent Nada Ibrahim held this exclusive interview with the head of the Zambian Constitutional Court, Deputy Chief Justice M.S. Mwanamwamwa. In the sense that uh, it promotes the spirit of Pan-Africanism, which entails cooperation among nations at large. With regard to judiciaries of Africa, it's a platform for sharing best practices and strategies in the running of the judiciaries, especially case management, dealing with the case works, case, case back backlogs. So far the main one is how you manage cases, backlog of cases. In, certain, in a number of jurisdictions, cases take too long to be heard and determined. Some, some jurisdictions can go up to 10 years. People are complaining. The question is, what measures do you put in place to address that? So that's been the main topic, the, the, the most uh, rewarding topic so far. We are sharing ideas on how to do case management. Some of the things you can resort to are Computerizing your court uh, operations, employing research advocates or law clerks certain, uh, as they know, in certain areas. Uh, going for what is known as uh, alternative dispute resolutions, ADR in short. That's, uh, this involves arbitration. Instead of cases being heard in court, you go for arbitration. You solve them amicably outside court. We we'll go for mediation. That's a short and cheap way of doing things. Syrian peace talks due to start this week in Geneva are based on the broad mandate of a UN resolution that asked the United Nations mediator to hold talks and a political transition process. Last week, the UN appeared to back away from using the phrase political transition, which is understood by the opposition, to mean a removal of President Bashar al-Assad or at least an erosion of his power. The details. 
CAP stocks restart in Geneva on Thursday after 10 month negotiations that has seen the opposition weakened and political upheaval in the foreign powers shaping the conflict. Since April 2016, when rival delegations were lost in the Suez city, government forces have recaptured territory, including eastern Aleppo. Main opposition ally Turkey has forged a partnership with government backer Russia. Hopes for breakthrough remain dim, with the sides still deadlocked over President Bashar al-Assad's fate and violence on the ground persisting. United Nations envoy Stefan de Mistura has moderated three failed previous round of talks and said he was not deluded about the prospects for a deal this time. But he told the weekend security conference in Munich it's time to try again. De Mistura has said the agenda remains consistent with the last round, meaning rivals will discuss governance, drafting a new constitution and organizing UN monitored elections in keeping the framework laid out by the Security Council in 2015. However, experts said that unlike 10 months ago, the rebels have pretty much lost all leverage. Turkey, Russia and fellow regime backer Iran have organized separate negotiations in Kazakhstan's capital state viewed as prelude to the UN talks. Moscow's military support for Assad has been decisive, notably in the regime's Aleppo victory, but observers said Russia's renewed diplomatic push could help the Geneva meet. During past rounds in Geneva, the government has categorically insisted that Assad's fate was not up for discussion. The Turkish military said on Tuesday that 44 Daesh terrorists were killed by Turkey-backed operations around the Syrian town of al bab and in the U.S.-led coalition airstrikes on Monday. The army said one Turkish soldier was killed and two were wounded during work to clear landmines and explosives in the area, reiterating that it had largely established control in the residential areas of al bab the Daesh stronghold 30 kilometers from the Turkish border has been a prime target since Turkey launched an incursion in rebels last August to push the group from its frontier and prevent gains by a Kurdish militia. Turkey's army said 15 of the militants were killed in clashes, artillery fire and airstrikes during operations in Al-Bab, while the remaining 29 were killed and four buildings were destroyed in the coalition airstrikes. To Iraq, where a military spokesman said Iraqi forces are consolidating their gains south of Mosul ahead of moving deeper into the city's Daesh held western half. Spokesman for the Joint Military Operation Command on Tuesday said that nearly 123 square kilometers, about 47 square miles, have been taken south of Mosul since the new push started on Sunday. They wouldn't say when the next move into the city would start, adding troops are now fully in control of the hill of Abu Saif, overlooking the Mosul airport as well as the Hammam El Alil intersection on the May Highway into the city. The battle for Mosul, backed by the U.S.-led coalition, has already driven militants from the eastern half of the city. An Israeli military court on Tuesday sentenced a soldier to 18 months in prison for shooting dead a Palestinian injured. Judge Maya Heller handed down the sentence a month after Elora Zaria, who's 21, was found guilty of manslaughter for killing Abdel Fattah al-Sharif as he lay on the ground in the southern occupied West Bank in March last year. Prosecutors had demanded a three to five year sentence, but the panel of three judges decided such punishment would be too severe. The March 2016 shooting in the West occupied bank city of Al Khalil, Hebron, was caught on video by rights group and spread widely online. It showed Sharif was 21, lying on the ground, shot along another Palestinian. Azari then shoots him again in the head without any apparent provocation. Libya's Red Crescent said 74 bodies of migrants have washed ashore in the western city of Zawiya on the Mediterranean Sea. The aid organization spokesman, Mohamed Al-Misrati, said the bodies washed ashore on Tuesday morning. He added the circumstances involving the drowning of the migrants are not yet clear. He also said the local authorities will take the bodies to a cemetery in the capital of Tripoli that is allocated for unidentified persons. Migrant deaths have risen to record levels along the Libyan-Italy smuggling route across the Mediterranean Sea. 
The Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe repeated his pledge to stand in elections in 2018. Mugabe's statements came in an interview shown late on Monday on the state broadcaster. His pledge to run for the next presidential election comes despite calls from some Zimbabweans for him to quit amid economic turmoil in the once prosperous country and numerous allegations about human rights and election irregularities. The president said he was still popular and nobody is qualified to replace him. During the interview marking his 93rd birthday, Mugabe described his wife Grace an increasingly political figure. Mugabe says the women's wing of, of the ruling ZANU PF party chose Grace Mugabe as its head because of her political ambitions. United Nations Children's Agency said almost 1.4 million children suffering from severe malnutrition could die this year from famine in Nigeria, Somalia, South Sudan and Yemen. Said that in Yemen, where war has been raging for nearly two years, 462,000 children are suffering from acute malnutrition, whilst 450,000 are severely malnourished in the northeast. UNIDEF said uh, drought in Somalia has left 185,000 children on the brink of famine, but that figure is expected to reach 270,000 in the next few months. In South Sudan, over 270,000 children are malnourished, and a famine has just been declared in parts of Unity State in the north of the country where 20,000 children live. UNICEF Director Anthony Lake appealed for quick action. <coughs> UN Security Council ambassadors are due to travel to northern Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad and Niger next month to draw international attention to the humanitarian crisis in the region. U.S. President Donald Trump named Lieutenant General Herbert Raymond McMaster as his new national security advisor, choosing a military officer known for speaking his mind and challenging his superiors. McMaster is a highly regarded military tactician and strategic thinker, but his selection surprised some observers. White House officials said Monday Army Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster would remain on active military duty while leading the National Security Council. Trump called McMaster a man of tremendous Tremendous talent and tremendous experience when he introduced his new national security advisor at his private Florida club. McMaster returned to Washington with the president, said he looked forward to doing everything that, can, that he can do to advance and protect the interests of the American people. McMaster replaced retired General Michael Fallon, who was fired last week after Trump determined that Fallon had misled Vice President Mike Pence about the nature of his discussion with Russia's ambassador to the U.S. during the presidential transition. About 10,000 anti-Trump protesters marched in New York, joined by others in cities across the United States, on its President's Day holiday on Monday. The anti-Trump protest started one month ago after his January 20th inauguration. The 45th U.S. President is expected this week to work on filling out his administration's top spots and reforming his controversial immigration restrictions order that was blocked by the courts. Anti-Trump activists took advantage of the federal public holiday dedicated to U.S. presidents to organize rallies in Atlanta, Chicago, Los Angeles, Washington and other cities. According to an unofficial police estimate, the mood was festive and the crowd grew to over 10,000. The nation's died suddenly Monday after falling ill in his office at Russia's UN mission. Vitaly Cherkin was taken to hospital where he died a day before his 65th birthday. The cause of his death was still unknown. As Russia's envoy at the United Nations since 2006 and a diplomat for decades, Cherkin was considered Moscow's great champion at the UN where he was the longest serving ambassador on the powerful Security Council. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that the Ambassador Cherkin had served the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation with distinction through some of the most challenging and momentous periods of recent history and called him an outstanding diplomat. <coughs> United Nations Human Rights Envoy Yang Yi Li was Tuesday visiting refugee camps in southeastern Bangladesh where thousands have taken shelter after fleeing a military crackdown in Myanmar. Almost 73,000 Rohingya have arrived in Bangladesh since the military unleashed a four-month campaign of violence against the stateless Muslim minority that the United Nations says may amount to crimes against humanity. The refugees, most of whom are now living in squalid camps in the Cox Bazar district which borders Myanmar's Rohingya state, have bought harrowing accounts of systematic rape, killings and torture at the hands of the military. Lee, the UN Special Rapporteur on the issue, was in the coastal district on Tuesday 
after holding talks with government ministers in Dhaka about the crisis. Malaysian authorities said on Tuesday that they had yet to determine a cause of death in the killing of half-brother of North Korea's leader and had still to confirm the identity as no next to kin has come forward. Authorities said on Tuesday they had yet to determine the cause of the death in the killing of half-brother of North Korea's leader and had still to confirm the identity as no next of kin has come forward. Kim Jong-nam, the estranged half-brother of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, was killed at Kuala Lumpur International Airport last week. Malaysia's deputy prime minister has previously identified the victim as Kim Jong-nam, though formal identification of the corpse has not taken place. South Korean and U.S. officials have said they believe North Korean agents assassinated Kim Jong-nam, who had been living in the Chinese territory of Macau under Beijing's protection. No cause of the death had been determined yet for the exiled member of North Korea's ruling family who died last week after apparently being poisoned in a Kuala Lumpur airport. No family members have come forward to claim the body. Kim, the older half-brother of North Korea's ruler, has spent most of past 15 years living in China and Southeast Asia. The two nations have made a series of increasingly angry statements since then, with Malaysia insisting it's simply following its legal protocols and North Korea accusing Malaysia of working in collusion with its enemy South Korea. South Korea's spy agency believes North Korea was behind the killing but had produced no evidence to back that up. Police have so far arrested four people carrying identity documents from North Korea, Malaysia, Indonesia and Vietnam. Investigators are still looking for four North Korean men who arrived in Malaysia on different days beginning January 31st and flew out of the day of the attack.